the apostles preached a new thing. They ran all over the world, all of the inhabited world, the known world, preaching the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, that was the greatest present truth in the first century. As you read the New Testament, the letters of Paul and, and the sermons that are recorded there for us, the resurrection was pr proclaimed everywhere. It's still important, isn't it, to us? I believe it's still present truth, but this was a new thing. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the Sadducees didn't even believe in the resurrection and, and, and their congregations. And the Pharisees, it was also an incredible thing. It was a thing that they refused to believe for very selfish and prideful reasons. They had just crucified the Lord of glory 50 days before, and now Pentecost comes. Notice Peter's Pentecostal sermon. Uh, let's turn, if you'll turn with me to Acts, the second chapter. Acts chapter 2. Pentecostal sermon. Right in the heart of that sermon, this is what Peter had to say, starting with verse 32. He says, uh, this Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received with the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. And uh, actually the Holy Spirit was, was putting on quite a manifestation for the, for the um, spread of the gospel, starting there in, right there in Jerusalem. We could drop down to 37, verse 37. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all them that are far off. Who might that be? We're far off from there, aren't we? 2,000 years afar off. As for us, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they, glad, they that gladly received the word were baptized. And the same day there were about added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread, and in prayers. What a manifestation that was. 3,000 baptized in one day, in one place. That was a new thing. When Jones and Wagner were preaching in 1888, the purest gospel, it was almost unbelievable. So unbelievable that many were murmuring that if we listen to this, We'll do away with the Advent message and the law and sanctification and all those things. That was a new thing. Paul faced the same stiff, stiff opposition in, uh, in his day. In Romans chapter 3, verse 31, he says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Why would he say that? Because he'd been preaching a message that had been interpreted as doing away with the law, right? Notice what he, what he was, uh, you'll find this in Romans chapter 3. Notice what he had been preaching. Romans chapter 3. This is a powerful chapter. Romans 3 and 4, I would recommend it for a good Sabbath afternoon read. And just uh, bathe your eyes in this. Romans chapter 3. Notice what he had been preaching. That caused him to say, do we then make void the law through faith? Verse 20. Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And verse 27 and 28. Where is boasting then? It is, it is excluded. By what law? 
of works? Nay, but the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. No wonder he got a lot of opposition, stiff opposition. People didn't understand what he was saying hardly. And he had to say, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. I have to say that only justified believers even have a, even have a desire to keep the law. To everybody else, it's, uh, it is a, uh, it's a hard saying to keep the law. Don't be afraid of the purest gospel. It establishes the law. It is the schoolmaster that leads us to Jesus, right? That's where we really want to go. How else could we find Jesus? Uh, we're all familiar with that text in Romans 3, or Galatians 3.24, which says that the law is our schoolmaster to do what? To lead us to Christ. Um, how else would I know that I'm a sinner unless I, unless, unless I uh, have the law? You know, the law is found all through the Bible. In fact, the, the law and the gospel compose the Bible. The law, the works of Moses, but it's found all through the Bible. We find law, what we, the imperatives of the, of the Christian life are scattered all through the Bible, but very close by is the gospel. You'll find them sometimes in the same text. And the proud human heart refuses to believe that our good works, even our best law keeping, are not the basis for our acceptance with God. They're only the entrance, the, the gate by which we can see that we're sinners and lead us to Christ and our need for a Savior. You know, after all, I walk on my own two feet. I'm glad about that. <laughs> I have a new knee and it's starting to work pretty good. I make decisions on my own. I work hard so I can pay my bills. That's why it's so hard to believe that when it comes to salvation that even our best works do not merit salvation. Even our best works. What are some of the best things that you do? Your prayers, your praise, uh, helping other people. The very best things that we do must be moistened with the incense of Christ's righteousness or they would be of no acceptance of God. God wants us to raise our hands to heaven and, and, and exclaim, I give up. Nothing in my hand I bring, but simply to what? Like cross I cling. You know, the, the, uh, Steve and I were talking yesterday. These wonderful songs that we have in the hymnals, they, I believe, are inspired uh, for our benefit. That's where the real power is. In reality, the highest point that we can attain in this life is at the foot of the cross. That's the highest point that we can attain. I would like to invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, talking about where the power is. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is what? The power of God. The doing and suffering of Jesus is the power of God. And um, contemplation of this is what will cause the glory of man to be humbled in the dust. No room for boasting here. No room for criticizing others here, right? The gospel is the great leveler. As we look out across the congregation, we're all equal here in this, right? Because I heard said this morning that we're still sinning. Doug, you mentioned that this morning. We're still sinners, right? And God does not leave, a, leave the final generation out of all this good news in the teachings of Peter and Paul. I'd like to have you notice with me the preaching of Peter. This is a little bit time later after the day of Pentecost. But it's Acts 3.19. Actually, let's start with verse 18. Acts chapter 3, 3 verse 18. Acts chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, down to 21. But those things which God before hath showed by the, had showed by the mouth of all of his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye, what's the next word? 
therefore, in view of, therefore, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be what? It doesn't say forgiven, does it? It says blotted out. That's different. Uh, in Acts 2.38, in his Pentecostal sermon, he talks about the remission of sin, I mean, being baptized. And, uh, and your sins be forgiven. But this is not that. This is an end time text. Notice what it says here. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when what? Times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Spirit prophecy identifies this with the latter rain, by the way. This is an end time idea. If you have a great controversy at home, I'd invite you to read page 612 where this text is used. And he, and he shall send Jesus Christ. What's that referring to? Sins blotted out? Refreshing from the presence of the Lord? And he shall send Jesus. What does that mean? Second coming. Exactly. Which before was preached unto you. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Which God hath spoken by the mouth of his, mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. What an idea. He shall send Jesus, second coming. In view of all of this, repent ye therefore and be converted. This is a view into the judgment of the living. That's our generation. Cleansing the sanctuary. Sins blotted out. First angel says the hour of God's judgment is what? Come. Not coming, but come. Hour of God's judgment is come. Latter rain. Refreshing from the presence of the Lord. There's a, there's a tremendous word description of what the judgment of the living will be like. And you'll find this in the inspired writings uh, about the judgment of the living. It's Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall, what does it say next? Suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. There are a number of texts like this, uh, scattered out through the minor prophets. And then verse 2. Who may abide the day of his coming? This is not talking about the second coming of Jesus. This is talking about the judgment of the living, which, we are, which is very imminent. Soon, none know how soon, it will come to the names of what? The living generation. Who shall, st who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He shall sit as the refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi, purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering and righteousness. I'm going to read verse 4 with this also. It says, Then, then, shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. This is what we have to look forward to. That's all day of atonement language. The hour of God's judgment is day of atonement language. Followed by a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Uh, and uh, that time of trouble will be a time of great faith testing and it will be a time when the last remnants of earthiness will be removed before Jesus comes. You know, uh, how else could believers look up into the sky and say, lo, this is our God, we have waited for him. Nobody in, in the history of the earth has been able to do that, face to face with God. Moses couldn't do it on the mountain, could he? The Lord said, he said, I want to see you. I want to see you face to face. The Lord said, no, he said, I'll let you see my backside. And even then, as he goes down to the encampment of Israel, his face was shining so brightly that people couldn't even stand and said, Moses, go back to the mountain. We can't stand this anymore. But here in the end of time are a people 
who are looking up into the heavens and they're saying, lo, this is our God, we've waited for him. There is a tremendous amount of, of cleansing that takes place before Jesus comes. And uh, the great doctrine of the cleansing of the sanctuary is that doctrine. For on that day shall the priest make, him, make an atonement for who? You, that you may be clean from how many of your sins? All of your sins before the Lord. That's how people are made ready for translation. That's what's in reserve for the people who are no longer boastful and prideful and proud of their accomplishments or of their, or of their uh, performance, but have turned, learned to wholly lead, lead on, lean on Jesus. You know, Christianity is the only faith, real faith religion in the world. And salvation is by what? Faith. A lot of evidence along the way, though, isn't there. Abraham and Sarah were asked to believe a new thing. That God could bring about regeneration in their bodies and the powers of procreation in their old age. So that Isaac could be born. That was a new thing. They, they didn't believe it at first, right? In fact, when it was first announced to them, Sarah was in her tent and she started laughing, right? Remember that? <laughs> what a ridiculous thing to say. In Luther day, Luther's day, in the 1500s, justification by faith was a new thing that had been buried for over 1,200 years under the trash heap of false doctrine. Dark and Middle Ages here. Luther's message to the people in his day was not just try harder, try harder, okay? Try harder next time the temptation comes. That wasn't his message. His message that, that was the message to those who did not believe the gospel of Christ. His message was simply, don't resist the drawing power of the cross. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will what? I will draw all men unto me. Like the serpent in the wilderness, I would like to have you turn with me to John 3, verses 14 to 17. This is the conversations that... Uh, Jesus had with Nicodemus uh, kind of a night, a night meeting that uh, Nicodemus was pricked in his heart, no doubt. But he didn't want to come meet Jesus in the middle of the day when everybody was seeing him. So he was a member of maybe one of the most powerful people in the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus, a proud Pharisee. He comes to Jesus because he'd been hearing things. Notice what he says in John, Jesus says to Nicodemus in John 3, 14 to 17, 14 to 17. And as Moses lift up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave not his only begotten, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, that the world, but that the world might through him might be saved. He's talking uh, about, uh, he's not talking about doing, but by what? Looking. With the dead and dying all around, uh, this is an allusion to the experience in the wilderness of fiery serpents coming into, into the camp, coming into the tents, coming everywhere. The dead and dying were all around. And uh, so God, Moses was told to make a serpent out of brass, lift it high in the sky, and to look, and they would be healed. And it must have seemed foolish that they could be healed by looking at something in the sky, right? It's a new thing. But righteousness is a faith. And as we look at the uplifted Savior, faith is born in the hearts of those that look. Faith brings a strong love for Jesus. That's what faith does. How does faith come to us, by the way? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's how faith comes. Could we find a little time every day to spend with Jesus, learning to know of him? This is a Jesus book. 
The whole book is about him. Old Testament and New Testament. And so faith comes by hearing. Hearing brings a strong love for Jesus because we learn to know him. To know him is to what? Love him. Faith brings a strong love for Jesus. And we all know that text in John 14, 15. If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. This is the only way we're empowered to keep his commandments. Those final people living on the earth just before Jesus comes, it says they, they keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That becomes total dependence now, right? This is a, something that does not come by, by just uh, doing and trying harder. Luther taught that we are saved in the righteousness of another, even Jesus Christ. And he used the expression, an outside of me righteousness. He did that on purpose. Now, the reformers called it an alien righteousness. Why would they call it that? Because it's not something that's generated within us, right? It comes by looking. And that's how we're, that's, that's why we're, how we're healed. Uh, that was a new thing in Luther's day. And it wasn't very welcome. In fact, it almost brought about his martyrdom at one point. And I dare say that it's a new thing today, too. That faith bears the fruit of obedience. Every willing heart. It's accomplished only as we're focused on the righteousness of Christ. Through the word. The Holy Spirit leads us here. The Holy Spirit never works apart from the what? The word. That's how we receive our information and our understanding and our inspiration. That's where faith comes from. We do this by spending some quality time every day with Jesus, by burying ourselves in the word, praying for the Holy Spirit, praying for light. Isn't that how we prepare for the end time? I don't know of anything else we could do. Do you know of anything else we could do? This is so simple that people refuse to believe it. I think we've got to do something. Uh, some time ago, I heard somebody say, I just got a gift. I wonder what I should get for him. <laughs> Isn't that, <laughs> and, and a guilt trip is born, right? <laughs> we think we've got to do something. Salvation is a gift. <laughs> it's free, but it costs somebody an awful lot to get it for us. It's a precious gift. Accept it graciously, like you would any gift. We call it the miracle of the new birth. Christ's righteous life and his obedient death is the root of our salvation. And obedience from the heart is the fruit that springs from that. It's innocent obedience. It's not trying harder. We, did, we receive a hatred for evil and a love for what? Righteousness and truth. That's a miracle. And when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about the new birth being brought about by the Holy Spirit, he said, the wind blows. He said, you can't see it. But you can see the results of it. And uh, that was in our Sabbath school lesson this week, right? In the days of William Miller, it was a new thing that Jesus Christ would come in the clouds of heaven. In the glory of his Father and all the angels with him. That was a new thing. Actually, in Christian literature, before the year 1800, there's very, very little written in the previous 1,200 years about the second coming of Jesus. Very little. I think the Wesley brothers might have talked about it a little bit. Luther said he thought it was going to happen 500 years later, after his time. He was, he, he was in the 15, middle 1500s. <laughs> but there was very little said about the second coming of Jesus. And as William Miller began to study the prophecies and began to preach about the second coming, it was a new thing. Hard to believe, right? Mechanics laid down their tools. Farmers left their potatoes in the ground on that fateful day in 1844. Jesus didn't come. Who were these people anyway? 
These were Methodists and Baptists. These were, there were some Catholics among them. These were people of the religious world. When they met on Sunday morning in their churches, there would be Presbyterian in one side and Presbyterian Adventists on the other side. This was before there were any Seventh-day Adventists. Long before, really. And they went forth to proclaim a new, a new message. Jesus is coming. Faith led, faith led them to a new thing. Faith inspires people today to distrust their youthful ambition and strength and cast their helpless souls on Jesus. The test to this generation is found in Acts 3.19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be what? Blotted out. When times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. This is how we prepare for that coming. That God will blot out your sins in the pre-advent judgment of the living. And seal you with his seal. That's what the judgment our message is in the first angel. No one else believes such a thing, but a few who are looking for the literal, visible, audible, personal coming of Jesus in the clouds of heaven. It's one of the best kept secrets in all the world. By the way, that's not to our credit, is it? <laughs> Come this afternoon at four, we'll see if we can help do something about that. All he asks us to do is show up in faith and dwell with him in heavenly places and cooperate with him in his finishing work against sin. In order to cooperate, we need to be intelligent about what he's doing, right? How can we, how can we cooperate with him if we don't know what he's doing? Here's where the sanctuary comes in. This sanctuary message, I'll tell you something, is something that we need to really bury ourselves in because uh, it's the only original contribution that Adventists have made to Christian theology, literally. And it is the thing that prepares a people for the second coming. The book of Hebrews is dedicated to the idea of teaching people about Christ's ministry as our high priest in heavenly places. What an idea that is. This will be a new experience for the people of God, a new thing. When sins are blotted out, they will look for their sins and they cannot be found. I'd like to read a couple of texts here that are astounding to me. One of them is in Jeremiah 50.20. Jeremiah 50.20. Isaiah, Jeremiah. When you're found to say amen. Jeremiah 50.20. <clears throat> Here's what it says. In those days... And in that time, when the prophet says, in that time, in those days, what is he talking about? He's talking about someplace off in the future. It says, in those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel will be sought for, and there shall be what? None. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. What a precious promise that is. Turn with me also to Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Well, we read those verses, but let's go to 16 to 18. Malachi 3, 16 to 18. I'm trying to conserve time here a little bit. Verse 16, it says, And they that feared the Lord spake often to one another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him, for them that feared the Lord and that taught upon his name. What is this anyway? This is a sanctuary idea. In fact, this sanctuary idea is found all through, scattered all through the Bible. Book of Remembrance. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. What is that talking about? The judgment. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son. Then shall you return, discern between righteousness and the wicked between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. This is the result of that tremendous thing. 
true believers will be cleansed and made ready for translation. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Don't hear it very often. What is translation anyway? It's going to heaven without seeing death. Is that the blessed hope of the final generation? Going to heaven without seeing death? This is a new thing. Can you believe such a promise as that? Then we which are alive and remain shall meet the Lord in the air, right? So there will be people alive when Jesus comes. Don't fear that this earth is going to be destroyed with atomic bombs and everybody killed beforehand. People are thinking about those things now. Two nations in the world that uh, are a little bit uh, against us right now. People who don't know this wonderful message can be caught up in a lot of fear. Don't let that happen. The genuine faith, genuinely faithful in Laodicea will cast their helpless souls in the mercy of Christ and like the jailer in Acts 2, they will exclaim, what can I do to be saved? That should be on our mind every day. What must I do? To be? And what was the answer? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, thou and thy house. And that same day they were baptized. His family was baptized. What an idea. That was a new thing. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. As the awakening was developing, these words point forward to the judgment. It says, He that overcometh shall be clothed with what? White Raymond, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. What a promise that is. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. There comes a time when there will be some who will not remain in the book of life, according to this verse, right? This thing is reversible. Yes, overcoming is the fruit of this Faith, not a works program, but a friendship walk with Jesus. Jesus will take all of his forever friends to heaven with him. This is the blessed hope. Not a work, but a walk with Jesus every day. That's what friends do, right? He said, after, after this, I'm going to call you my what? My friends. He's making forever friends throughout the world right now. The gospel may be farther along in being finished than we even dream. All this is to prepare people to stand in the great day of God. That's a new thing. And the final generation will experience it. Never in the history of the world has a generation be called to such a happening as this. Joel 2 talks about preparation for the day of atonement. It talks about the repentance, what it looks like. Joel chapter 2, another chapter to read, and you'll, I, I've been, I've read that the Joel chapter 2 was read on the Day of Atonement as the people were all gathered around the sanctuary, around the temple. Joel chapter 2, how to prepare for the Day of Atonement. We are called to believe in something not yet seen in the experience of the church in 6,000 years. We stagger at the promise in, in unbelief as Abraham and Sarah did in their early life. There will be a people, yet, there will yet be a people in whose mouth is no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. This is what needs to happen before Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. These are the sealed ones. They're described in Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 to 5. And the following verses tell how they got that way. When we talk about the judgment, we're talking about something urgent. These are here called the first fruits unto God. That sounds like a new thing to me. Never in the history of the world have there been a community of people like this. Yes, there have been individuals. We know who they are, don't we? We can think about Enoch and Elijah living in different generations and Daniel. 
Their experience was something new in their generations too. In fact, Enoch was taken to heaven. He was translated. And uh, Elijah was translated. But in the time of the end, God will have a whole community of people who have the faith of Jesus as a result. Because of the fruit, they keep the commandments of God. This is a new thing. We are on ground that's never been experienced on this planet before. That's the ground we stand on, except by Jesus Christ himself. And he is the forerunner of our faith. I do have one more text here I would like to, like to fit in if I can. If we could turn to Hebrews chapter 12, 1 to 4. Jesus is our forerunner. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. <clears throat> And let's letting some of this go here because I always have way too much. Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 4. Take all the comfort you can out of a verse like this. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. You now this follows Hebrews chapter 11. It's the faith chapter. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and what? finisher of our faith he is the forerunner of our faith and he's the finisher of it who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God you know if this is what brought joy to him looking down through the centuries and seeing people who would believe if that brought joy to him what should be our response you can't wrap your tongue around what our response should be can you and it's possible because it comes by what? Faith. For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest ye, be, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted against blood. Anybody here resist sin against, with blood? Only one has done that. So uh, interesting, interesting idea. In closing, as the time passes, the realization of the promises for the final generation will seem more and more hopeless to many people. But the Bible says that he that endureth to what? The end shall be saved. Don't lose hope. Just because we've been here 176 years proclaiming this, don't lose hope. He that endureth to the end will be saved. The Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And I'll tell you, he can still be found. When the plagues begin to fall, it'll be too late. Actually, I could say this, I think, with some assurance, that it'll be too late when the great test comes to the church. There'll still be mercy extended to the world because a loud cry will go forth. And uh, David, all these seeds that are being planted will germinate in that time. And we may not see the results of all of this. But we have a great commission. That's our mission, is the great commission. And in judgment, Christ will make the eternal verdict finally. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. That's the verdict of the judgment. That's the verdict of the judgment of the living. The dead are already in their graves, but this is for the judgment of the living. Faith is counted for righteousness. The verdict of the judgment will come from the judge of all the earth. My appeal today is, what will we do with this kind of information? Simple, positive information. I'd like to, in closing, just read some text from the mouth of Jesus himself, and then we will look at our closing song on the screen, and we'll just do one verse, the last verse, and I'll read those words from the screen. Um, we won't sing it. But let's turn to Matthew 24, right from the very words of our Savior, this same Jesus, Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to read some selected verses here. Matthew chapter 24. First of all, 13, 
and 14. Matthew 24, 13. But he, shall, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then what does it say? And then this end will come. You know, there's an end point to all of this. If there's anybody lonely here today, don't be lonely anymore. Learn to know Jesus. Because this same Jesus is still here. And verse uh, 20. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither the Sabbath day. There's a time of trouble coming. We don't, don't be to, these words are not meant to give us fear. They're meant to give us hope. He predicted it and he'll take us through it. Verse 21 and 22. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. For the elect's sake, those days will be, shall be shortened. When, you see, when you're down in the middle of the time of trouble, take, take this, this is, a, this is a promise to us. The time will be shortened, it won't be long, it won't be drawn out. Verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of, Light, of, Son of Man be. And verse 29 and 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven in the power, with power and great glory. And verse 31 and 32. And he shall send his angels with the sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. <laughs> Take, you can hardly wrap your tongue around that one either. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When the branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know the summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see, what is the next word here? All, all these things. When ye shall see all these things. What is he talking about? He's talking about what he's been presenting before. False prophets and famines and all kinds of things. I have to tell you, my friends. We're seeing all these things right now. Now, there have been times when there were wars, right? And various things happening in the earth. But he says when... Likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. And I like the next verse too. For verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. That generation that sees all of these things will see Jesus come in the clouds of heaven. On Christ the solid rock I stand. We'll have the last verse on the screen. I'm going to read the verse. In the interest of time, we'll just do the final verse. <clears throat> when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Clad in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you again for the many great and precious promises that you've given to us, the warnings that you've given to us, and the prospect of being a forever friend of you. I pray that you will be with each of us here today, that you will put within us the blessed hope, that it will not drift, might not drift away, but that we might endure to the end. Please be with each of us today according to our several needs, 
And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.